I'm Ellen Mary. And I'm Michael Perry. And he's a plant geek. And she's a plant addict. And, and this, this is, is the Plant Face Podcast. podcast. <laughs> This is more than just a gardening podcast. We'll be exploring the world of plants from every possible angle. We'll be talking about plant-based diets, plant materials and fabrics, the well-being qualities of plants, and giving plenty of gardening tips and tricks. So we'll be chatting worldwide to companies and individuals that are being creative with plants in new and exciting ways. From fabulous flower crowns to foliage-filled lounges, botanical moisturizers to bamboo clothing it's all here and it's all made of plants so today i am at the norfolk olive tree company and we're in a gorgeous shed with lights looking out to a very very rainy chilly breezy day but i cannot tell you how beautiful it is The courtyard here is like a Mediterranean courtyard and it's just full of olives and palms and there's this absolutely beautiful heart-shaped arch where I'm looking out through it and it's just simply stunning. So you'll see lots of photographs posted, don't worry about that. But we're inside in the warm, there's a little heater and there's lots of lovely little plants around as well and I'm with Paul and Antonia Smith who are owners of Norfolk Olive Tree Company. So, as you may imagine, we are going to chat about olives, but also we're going to chat about something extra. So, keep listening, because on the second half of this, we're going to be talking about, as Paul puts it, spiky plants. (laughs) Agave. Agave, yeah. And what else are we going to talk about? Uh, Uh, Mangave. Mangave. Cross between agave. That's right. So, that's really interesting. It is, yeah. A cross between the two. Okay, so cool. Um, I'm happy that I am in the warm, but also, I mean, just walking around outside amongst all that evergreen foliage is simply stunning at this time of year, isn't it? You know, when you've been indoors, it's gold outside, you know, there's not so much greenery, but you come in here and it is just, it's like a Mediterranean paradise. It really is. I love it so much. Um, I can even see some roses over there as well, don't they? look so pretty. And there's a blackbird coming for his mealworms. There's the little boy and the little girl. Right. As I was saying earlier on, they were both born here. Yeah. They were born in the olive tree outside of my shed, and then they return all the time, oh. so I feel a particular responsible. <laughs> a particular responsibility <laughs> towards them. <laughs> so we're here today to sort of make sure that they've been fed as well. Oh, it's so lovely. I might also add that whilst this podcast I am recording on my own, Mr Plant Geek is not far from us, is he? Because as I was looking out of the window, I can see that I'm a Plant Geek badges. <laughs> so if you would like one and you're in Norfolk, you could pop down to Norfolk Olive Tree Company and grab yourself a badge as well. So, Michael, you may not be here, but you are as close as you're going to get right you're now. with us in enamel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the best kind of way to be with us occasionally. <laughs> Just joking. Anyway, so guys, tell us all about you. Let's find out a little bit more about Paul and Antonia. Um, where did your love of gardening begin, Paul? Um, for me, my grandfather was a horticulturalist, so he worked at lots of stately homes uh, through probably sort of 1940s, 1950s, after the war. Uh, so as a child, I just used to go with him, walk around these amazing places, watch him... Wow propagate things which was like magic you know it is magic isn't it it? yeah yeah. you just think what you can cut that bit off that plant put it in this sort of soil and it'll grow and yeah yeah, yeah. so so it was just for me it was just a real love of of being with him as a grandfather you know as a kid sort of loving being with your grandparents on holiday but actually watching you know this alchemy this magic take place so got me into it through that and then i went into um working in arboriculture so working cutting trees and so working outside all the time, and then that, which led into just a general sort of love of plants and gardening, which I've always had. But you know, it's 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 difficult to find the time when you're younger. You know, you're out doing lots of other things. So you yeah. kind of, and as I've got older, I've become more and more just doing plants and not going out at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it feels like. That's what it feels like. <laughs> what about you, Antonio? Well, my introduction was very different. I mean, I did 
I didn't have a grandfather to introduce me into gardening. I did have my grandmother's gardener. Okay. So I would follow him around in the garden and help. Um, but for me, it definitely came much later. I always lived, I lived abroad, I lived in Paris and I lived in the south of France. So for me, it was much more of a spectator thing. I used to love wandering around the streets of Montmartre and the 18th arrondissement where I lived, wow. looking at the little courtyards. So everything was always in, in small, small courtyards, uh, window, what balconies, they called, uh, balconies balcony. and things like that. So for me, that's how I, it's like a spectator thing, sort of taking photographs of them, really enjoying that. That sounds really romantic. Well, it was. I mean, the 18th arrondissement where I lived in Montmartre was very romantic. It was the romantic quarter where George Sands and a lot of the writers were. So the whole place looked like it was sort of window dressed, you know, so... There was always geraniums, there were always plants, there was always pots of lavenders on tables and lots of jasmine. So for me, I just always appreciated it without really knowing much about it. And then no. as I've been with Paul 20 years now and I've a, a, caught, a eh? And <laughs> learned a lot through him and through running the business, really. Yeah. So I mean, what, what, the, what we, I mean, what we do as a business kind of... Uh, it, it brings a lot of that in, that, that thing that Antonio was talking about, you know, because we deal very much in those small spaces and, and kind of how plants work with architecture and it's, it's a real, you know, you're not just a big lump of grass where you're putting plants in, you know, you're using mm. courtyards and buildings and, and it's, that's part of, you know, the kind of plant palette we, we work with goes very well within that kind of small spaced, you know, it, it gives you something really different and a real sort of different feel to a, a space you know and I think that's that comes from Antonio like I say I'm I'm a real propagator kind of love of hands in soil but Antonia's you know her views of of what plants can do to a space are, are, are very important to the business so well you sound like a perfect team yeah I think we are actually <laughs> but I do know that you like to close the shed door and you like to keep it open yes. so yeah. you know <laughs> yeah. yeah we do have differences we yeah. do have differences that. come in close the door close the door I'm going to close the door <laughs> well this I mean the whole of the front of this shed is complete glass so it is like a window onto a world so I love looking out at the different shapes and the contrast of the colours the many shades of green and the foliage and the shapes of the leaves and everything. So it is, it's like a sort of living painting. And I think that's how I always view things more as tableaus or mise-en-scenes, almost like a theatrical a theatrical piece, like garden design is, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's, it's, you know. exactly, it's <coughs> art at the end mm. of the day. And I'm sitting here thinking, did you plan this view from the shed? Because it's literally stunning it looks like that's exactly how you meant to do it do yeah. you know what i mean like yeah. the, you're looking out under the arch and you've got i mean it's just so beautiful we, we do move it around we a fair around bit a but um yeah but there's always that trying to find focal points you know so and it's like say with garden design with you know when we do show gardens it's your focal point and then framing things so yeah. Which is what this window space is. It's looking out there, like so you've got the lovely big heart, and then all the, the sort of daisy lyrians and cycads and various Glasses. things framing it and Glasses, softening it. Yeah. And so it's it's kind of yeah. You do. I think if you love plants and you can't help but try and make the plant look its best. You yeah. Know, you don't just. I mean, yeah. you go to some garden centre and saying, and they're all in lines, and you just oh. think, well, you know, it, you might as well be Ooh. buying packets of cereal. Really, <laughs> it's kind of it, in some respects, you know, you don't you don't have a kind of feel of what that plant will look like in a space. But if you put them in, you know, artistically, then there is know. something about this courtyard. When you walk in, you have an immediate sense of relaxation for a start, don't you? You just kind of breathe, like oh. Yeah. Yeah. This is, it's very relaxing. It's obviously, it's like the plants are mostly taller than me. So it's all around you when you feel immersed in this yeah. lovely world of plants and, yeah. and evergreens, you know. It's actually raining a lot right now. It's got worse, I think. And, um, you, but it just, it almost feels like it's summer do you, yeah. because of all of the evergreen. Yeah. It's beautiful. Absolutely. And also there's lights in the shed and you can see the um, reflection in the window and it's just, it is very slightly romantic. Mm. I think that's your touch. Queen of the garden. I queen see you have a sign over your head that says queen of the garden. <laughs> you are romance. queen of the garden. <laughs> queen of romance, yeah. <laughs> so tell us then, why did you decide to open Norfolk Olive Tree Company? What is it about olives that you love? 
Um, I mean, there's lots of... I mean, we... Uh, we worked with other plants for, like I said, for quite a long time. Um, with olives, we found that we were dealing with something which puts a kind of immediate sort of uh, sort of age and gravitas into a space. So you can you can mm -hmm. put something in which is evergreen. It's got history to it. It's like a living sculpture. So they're a fantastic plant to work with. If you have a, a space, you put one in. You can work around it, and you know it makes everything else it lifts everything, makes everything else look more than just. A small plant you know because it's yeah. it, it complements things so we we sort of we you know got into olives through doing that i did garden design used olives in the garden design um they're just amazing plants to work with and then you suddenly realize you can buy olives in so many different shapes and sizes so you've got cloud trees and pom-pom trees and gnarled trees and open crown fruiting trees so you just you know, within it's not just an olive tree. There's the whole diversity of what the olive tree is and what it does to a space. So yeah, I love the really gnarly yeah. old olive trees where yeah. the bark is just so beautiful and you feel like it has a history. Yeah, it's absolutely. seen so much. Well, I mean, some of these yeah, are three hundred years old. You know, so That's that we have, mad. and uh, you know, they have got a lot of history. Yeah, obviously, you know, That's seen mad. a lot. They retired from working life because they weren't producing enough fruit to earn their keep. Or you also get the element where you'll get a family that inherits the grandfather's olive grove, but they have no interest in it. So these right. trees become redundant. And I think, you know, the English have a lot to... I was going to say a lot to answer for, but that's negative. The, the English have a lot to do with the, 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 the increased popularity of the olive tree because of things like the Chelsea Flower Show. Yeah and the Occitan Garden, um, that was about 10 years ago. And right. it's really grown in popularity. And I think the English have a lot to do with that yeah. because <clears throat> a lot of big des designers use them. Yeah. But you can see why, sitting here looking out mm. here, yeah. you can see absolutely I mean, that's why. Kind of, I mean, it's a positive thing. I know lots of people have a thing where you're digging a tree up from the Mediterranean, bringing it to a damper, cold climate. But the, the, the thing is, there are so many olive trees throughout the Mediterranean. A lot of those used to be just grubbed up and dug up and cut into firewood and right. burnt. And, you know, they build a, a housing area where these trees were. So, in theory, you're saving Yeah, you're these extending trees. their yeah, lives. So exactly, yeah. you know. And, and, you know, obviously, there are really old special trees are not allowed to be dug up or moved. But, the, you know, it's... it's so although it feels like you're bringing lots of things across that don't necessarily belong here, you know, you're you're actually giving new life to yeah, quite. to these, I these love plants. Yeah. The, I mean, we have olive trees that are 300 years old, but the average tree lives for uh, olive tree lives for 800 years oh old anyway. Word. So it's got so much longer. Wow. Well, they can live into the thousands. You know, this is so. You know, the, that's the amazing, is. isn't it? I have this. Um, I think I probably told you guys this before. One day, I'm going to have like a courtyard garden, which is likely to be much smaller than what we're looking at here. And I want one big olive tree, one olive tree in the middle of the courtyard, and, I, and then like some Mediterranean table and chairs and just have some, maybe some yeah. lavenders, maybe some salvias, <clears throat> a little like maybe kind of like a nice clematis or even a jasmine maybe, you know, something like that. I want it to be quite basic, but beautiful. Do you know what I mean? And I think an olive tree gives you that. Yeah. You know, well, when you think about how many new builds there are in the UK, you know, and uh, I wrote about it recently, properties now are 33% smaller than they were in the 70s, and gardens are 33% smaller. So it's about making, maximising on that space and making it really work all year round. And the Mediterranean palette does that because it is evergreen. So there's no periods of being dormant. They just work all year round. Yeah. And so many of them are super hardy as well. We Again, we think, oh, they're Mediterranean. They're not going to cope with the Norfolk uh, or the UK weather. But actually, you know, places like Cambridge has uh, less hours of rain a year than Barcelona. Barcelona has more <laughs> rain per yeah. capita wow. than, uh, here, than Cambridge. We're on the sort of same zonal um, codes as, as much of the Mediterranean, so we're kind of an 8A, 8B zonal code, which means, you know, obviously we can grow the, pretty much the same plants. The only thing we ever struggle with sometimes we have quite a lot of rain obviously lately yeah, so, right it, it now, kind of, yeah. so oh, some of the plants it. don't you know certainly the spiky plants as we'll talk about some <laughs> of those don't like as much of you know wet 
that we get in. But across, obviously, in East Anglia, we're, our rainfall is, is right. lower than other parts of the country, obviously. Amazing. So, yeah. I love the zones, actually. I was looking at a map about zones. Yeah. It's incredible how they <clears throat> kind of sweep across and you think, well, how is up there the same as yeah. down there or across yeah. there? It's quite... I think in, in the UK it's one of those, because they're obviously an American kind of thing, we yeah. see the zones, so we don't know. Lots of people say, oh, it's zone 7 or it's zone 9, and yeah. we don't know what that means. Yeah. But, but, I mean, I've, the same as you, in the last few years, got myself it's quite au fait with the zones. It is, yeah. I think yeah. if you do that, it can really teach you a lot about yeah, what, you can, does, what, yeah. what you can grow or what yeah. you can maximise in your space. In America, where I'll be, I've already checked out my zone. It's no. 7B. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I, already, I had to work that one out straight away. <laughs> it was a, never mind the apartment or anything practical in any way. I just wanted to know what I could grow. Maybe slightly yeah. colder than we get here then in the wintertime. Overnight, yeah. In, yeah. in the wintertime, it's uh, minus, it's already, like, December was like minus one, minus two, yeah. minus more than that. But then it heats up in the day. Yeah. But actually that can cause some problems, you know, because it heats yeah. up quite quick if in the day, but it's very quickly. cold at night. And so that gives you other problems with yeah, plants, it does, you yeah. know. So yeah. interesting. Anyway, yeah, um, now really the point of this talk today <laughs> is all about the spiky plants. <laughs> so um, just, we're going to have a little break for a moment. But before I do that, can you just give listeners an idea of what we're going to talk about in the second half? Um, yeah, we'll be um, looking at and talking about um, agave and mangave, which are a cross with an agave and another plant called a manfreda. Um, there's over, well, over 200 different types of agave. Uh, the mangaves are developing all the time, so there's, there's certainly over 40 now. Uh, they're being bred, they're not available in the UK retail wise yet uh, so we'll be looking at those talking about the, the differences in them obviously whether you can grow them over here what you know the what best way to grow them what conditions they need uh, but yeah the, and just the variation in them and why certain cool. people people like me become obsessive about <laughs> plants like agave and our house is full of them and people come over for dinner and end up with holes all over their elbows <laughs> <laughs> Not joking. Hence the spiky plants. <laughs> yes. So we're back. I hope you enjoyed hearing all about olive trees with Paul and Antonia and uh, we're still here in the lovely warm shed. Although we have just taken a walk around, we haven't have we? Had a little look around. A bit chilly got a bit chilly but we had to check out the agaves and also the mangaves which is what we're going to yeah. talk about yeah. uh, now in this half it is so interesting i mean i know a fair bit about agaves and interestingly yeah. on a flight very recently you know you have all the films that you can watch yeah. there's obviously loads of new films and all of that i picked a film about agave so it was all about um in south america um a couple of families who it's been in their you know, growing agave has been in their family for you know decades and decades and um then of course the consumer demand for tequila and how just growing the one agave yeah. is it the blue yeah is tequila, it, the blue tequila. Te yeah. yeah okay so that's the one that produces tequila yeah. but because of the overproduction of it that's now causing real soil problems and da 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 in this business that they were running so they were starting to diversify and look at growing other agaves and doing things with their land and da da, -da. it was so interesting yeah, it made yeah. the flight go by really quickly <laughs> but i thought of you genuinely <coughs> when what i was watched it, called? it oh. I, I tell you what i can tell you because i took a photograph of it on my phone I so when, when we're finished this yeah, i'll show you the photograph and tell you what the name of it was i can't remember now um, but it was really, really interesting, and I just because I know you guys, obviously, you know, you're big into agave and mangave, and it just made me think about yeah. you guys when I was there. Yeah. Anyway, so where did this obsession start from, Ooh. then, Paul? Um, phew, spiky plants, agave. Um, I think again, it's a plant that I think most people are familiar. Obviously, there's tequila, but most people are familiar with seeing them in south of France or Spain or wherever. Yeah. The big spiky plant, yeah. giant cactus-looking plant growing either beside the road or, or in sort of middle of towns in a kind of big bed. So it's that same thing because it's an evergreen, because it's structural, because it's, it gives you something completely different and also it's incredibly versatile as a plant in terms of, 
you know you can you can crossbreed them you can you can say oh I like this one it's green this one's got stripes in it we'll cross the two we'll get something that's, so that's, cool. a, that's in between the two and that's I think so that's cool. what you know they're real versatile plant and for so plant geeks it's a kind of, <laughs> it's very much one of those plants you can go I'm going to see what I can do with this plant and every plant they pup which means they have young that come from the root systems on them um, or not all of agave but most of them do uh, they can come through different to the parent plant right. so all the time you're getting a new pup through and you think I wonder if this has got a stripe in it or a variegation in it and that's cool yeah. and then you think if it has that it'll be the only one I've ever seen like that and I'll be able to put it on my agave websites and show people and they'll go oh you've got one of those with a stripe in it so it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of a real you know it's I just need you to know that Paul's very animated right now I think we <laughs> yeah, can tell that he animated. absolutely yeah. loves this I, very I much think, I think the thing is Certainly with, with agave and the mangaves, it's one of those things, if you're, we've all got, sort of, well, lots of us have got a collector genus. So, so for me, I was, as a teenager, I was buying albums, records, vinyl. Mm. It's that desire to have something which is mm. rare and unusual. And I think with, with agave, there is definitely that. It's not just a plant. You're not just going to find them all being exactly the same. There's going to be a variation in them. So you're, you're, there's over 200 different types but you'll get some which have got stripes through the middle of the leaves, you know, so you'll get a variation in the plant and you're looking for that all the time. So it's got that collector, sort of geek collector thing about them. You know, okay. you're, you're, we you're... love the plant geek thing going on. For yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, because obviously they are from South America, yeah. would we would it, it, you would perhaps assume that they wouldn't grow so well here, but that's not the case, is it? It's not the case with all of them. I mean, again, like I saying, there's over 200 types that are, majority of them will grow here. Pretty much all of them will grow here in certain conditions, but there's at least... 20 30 of them which you can just put in the garden at home and leave and they will grow if we have really wet winters maybe just put a makeshift shelter over them but the the cold burn some of them will take minus 20 or even colder if they're dry but even the sort of common types like the americana which is the one you see in south of france and yeah. spain um that will take sort of minus 10 minus 12 without a problem and wet so you might wow. get a few brown splodges on the leaves where it's got the damping, but when spring comes through, you cut those side leaves off and comes through from the middle. So, you know, it's, it's a plant which will cope with our conditions. So it's mainly the wet to be careful the of. The wet perhaps. is all, always an issue with, with wet. I mean, they're succulent, so any sort of succulent mm. is not going to like too much water. So, yeah. But if you plant them in pots so they're off the ground, water will drain out. If you put... If you, you know dig a bed and put lots of grit and stuff in the bed then also you know it'll help the drainage and and you know they won't have a problem it's only sitting in right heavy wet soil that things don't like and planting them at an angle as well if you are putting them in we've got lots in our borders at home and paul's put them all at an angle so when there is heavy rain the rain just drains away drains off so, not so it's all about the drainage, drainage isn't it drainage is a huge huge part of growing any succulents but I mean we have lots of even you know ripsalis and plants like that which really shouldn't grow outside we have them growing outside at home you know right. because we have so many plants because you're in zone da, 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 da. yeah zone, <laughs> zone 8a we're, and so in the city you know you've got and we're a walled garden you know we've got quite a microclimate and bananas right. and palms in the garden so yeah. you know you can have little spots where it's quite yeah. quite dry and quite yeah. sheltered and, and those plants will as long as they're not too wet they'll go through the, the cold you love know. it so, okay, so from your passion for agave has yeah. has come mangave. Mangave, yeah. Okay, so this is pretty new, new to me, apart yeah. from when I spoke to you about it. So tell it, tell us what this is, what um, this is a cross between. Well, mangave, there's, there's a plant called Manfreda, which is also known as a tuberose, which is a plant that grows in the wild in, in America, in southern states of America, um, where the agave grow. I, I, uh, probably, I think it was 2002, something like that, that someone discovered a cross between uh, agave, celsi, and uh, a manfreda, and sort of looked at it and thought, oh, this is an unusual plant, it's a new plant, how people do. And they sort of, sort of went in from there on thinking, well, I bet we can make several different types by crossing manfredas with lots of different agave. So that's how it started. And there's now over 40 different types yeah. that have been developed from just crossing crossing the Manfreda with various because there's over 200 agave just keep crossing them see what you get from it and and it's become a new sort of I didn't know about it until probably three years ago and I was 
on eBay, as you are sometimes, and I was <laughs> typing in agave, you know, think, oh, what agave on eBay? And this plant came up, which was a, which was a mangave. Right. And I thought, what on earth is that? So I looked into it from there and, and realised, oh, oh, this is a whole new world, you know. This is, so I'd got hundred odd sort of different agave and I thought this is this is a new one I can go on these now so a new obsession Antonia <laughs> new obsession the house is getting ever smaller the garden is getting ever smaller I mean he is an obsessive so oh come on come, oh, come on, on. <laughs> you don't get it so just tell us about the crossing process how does that work um it, you cross from the flowers obviously po pollination but you find basically there's there's a chap called Hans Hansen who's a Dutch guy he's working in America and he's he's pretty much developed these sort of 40 different at the moment it's, it's an ever increasing number um, and he, he's basically started them off by cross pollinating when when they're flowering but then they're also now growing them cell cell grown plants so because obviously to you can get one from a cross but you can't necessarily get 50 the same you, you know every pollination will throw up different genetic sort of codes within the plant so they then find the one they want and then they sort of cell grown grow right. that so it's it's a they haven't hit the market in the UK yet. They're in America. There's one or two starting to sort of be grown in, in Spain. I think they're going to launch them in 2021 was the, was the no, plan to launch them, launch them in the UK at Chelsea. Um, but by that time, you know, there's, there's people like me and lots of other people who are collecting these and bringing them over and, and growing their own ones. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's, you know... So you're propagating them yourself as well, I am, yeah, you? yeah. I've got quite a few <laughs> i've got i've got 25 different different uh, 25 different ones at the moment and some of them i have managed to probably uh, get numerous sort of eight ten different ones that i've got sort of several of so just tell us a little bit about what they look like so out here yeah outside the shed door there was a couple there one was called blood spot wasn't yeah. it and um, um, it, it it i was a bit transfixed I want to see it in the, in yeah. the summer. Well, they're, they're basically, it's got the good thing about um, mangave is that they tend to have characteristics from both parents, but they tend to not be too spiky. So, a lot of people have put off agave. I mean, I love the spikiness, but a lot of people have put off your arm didn't like the exactly, spikiness. Getting, getting, I have, I've heard uh, about the arm. <laughs> you don't want to be spiked by yeah, an agave, it's, it's, part, it's part of the, the you know, the love for them. <laughs> <laughs> it's like having a spiky wife. <laughs> <laughs> Paul's used to it, huh? <laughs> yeah, he's used to that. But, it, they, but the, the mangar, they are, are softer. They don't have... They, they, they've, because the tuberose, which is this plant here, yeah. um, Manfreda is a much softer, softer leaf and it doesn't have yeah. the spikes on it. So okay. you, basically you're getting a lot of the spots and stripes, which this has in the summer. Um, onto an agave but also you're softening the spikiness of it okay. so they're a much friendlier plant so they work well as a house plant or so some of them will take extreme cold as well but basically they color up in the sun so this time of the year like the one you looked at out there is not the spots aren't showing on it that much but you put it under a sun lamp or, or once the summer comes you get amazing colors and that's the great thing with them the color is you know reds and yellows and spots and stripes they've got everything and that's what makes them so interesting to people because they, you know, they're they're, they're completely different. Yeah, yeah. And then the one next to that was you said like a lavender kind lavender of lady, which is a, a attenuata uh, agave, which is a really soft a swan's neck agave. I think you see them tenere no. for the big flower. But anyway, it's a it's a, a really soft agave, but it's 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 got a real sort of purple lavender hue to it, which is which comes from crossing with the. I mean, sometimes they put two agave crossed with a, a Manfreda, and so they take right. all different characteristics from wow. a plant. I mean, it's, you know, you've got to do something, haven't you, in the cold winter's days. <laughs> you've got to mess around with plants and cross things, haven't you? I they? love that. You've telly. just got to. You've, got to. <laughs> you've just got to mess around with plants and cross them and all sorts of things. Yeah. You do, I agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, we've got loads. We've got, you know, at, at, at our nursery, we've got a whole polytunnel of probably a couple of thousand agave and mangaves in there wow. at the moment so and then you bring them into the courtyard here they come in here them. yeah we, we sell them uh we take them to shows and sell them do you uh, sell online yeah yeah online. sell online yeah so but we 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 tend to grow because they're all hard grown so a lot of plants if they're imported they're grown under you know really sort of perfect conditions they're sort right. of they're, they're hydroponically grown in 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 sort of five degree heat and per we grow all ours outside 
everything's growing outside. This time of the year, when it's really wet, we'll put them under cover, but there's no heating in the poly tunnel. No. It'll still go down to minus four, minus five. Right. And, Survival you know, of the fittest. Yeah, well, that's the way. And then if, good you're, though, right? if you're breeding from that plants. plant, then you know that it, genetically yeah. it's passing down a, a stronger yeah. code. So you're, you're all the time you, you're developing stronger plants which are ha happier in our, our climate. So, and I grow from seed as well. So they but they're growing from seed right the way through all hard grown. So they're all cold grown. There's How no many heating. years does it take for them to grow? Um, this plant here, which you see there, that's um, yeah. a whale's tongue of garvey. That one Let's was a seed. The ovidifolia. That's mm. four years old from seed. Okay. So that's now in a one litre pot and it's just hanging right. over the edge of the pot. So it's that okay. kind of size. The overtofolia is quite a fast growing agave. Okay, so they take a while to grow, but how yeah. satisfying is that oh, process? Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. I mean, I love it. And they, they, the thing about agave as well, you can grow them from seed really easily. So they'll germinate within a week. So it's not like stick it in the fridge wow. and you know like you get all these sometimes you have to put them in the fridge and then jump up and down and <laughs> you know wave some burning sage over it or something it's not it's not that you know it literally is a put it put it on top of some vermiculite or right. you know, soil based vermiculite and and it you know, will yeah generate. and it, within a week you'll get like little blades of grass coming up and that's cool. that and then four years later <laughs> Four you've years later, just four, four, years, years. four years later, you've got a lovely plant. I have to just say, though, completely off to topic, you've got a bird's nest next to that. That's where the, yeah. the blackbirds that are playing in the garden or foraging, that's where they were born, in an olive tree just outside the oh, shed door. That's so gorgeous. I've kept that for them as part of their memory box. <laughs> 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 come back in here and have a nest over have some babies they just, the yeah they just might want some warmth they want to pop in the shed and <laughs> go to bed do, they will do oh they will do. Yeah, they do come in here. paul do you think that this has um satisfied your obsession for the years ahead or <laughs> uh, I, uh, oh, oh. Uh, unlikely i mean <laughs> i mean I, it, for for the next what will happen i mean i know how i work <laughs> and what will happen is that by the time Mangave come across to the UK, probably in two years' time, because they will be at other garden centres, I will go off them a little bit. <laughs> because it, it's that, <laughs> it's that, that need to find something that other people haven't got, you know. So it's just... And, and so, although, you know, I'll still love them as plants, but I will certainly start to go, well, what's what can I do what's here? Next? What's next? Yeah, because what's next? that's... I just need to find things all the but time. But looking ahead is good for your business anyway, isn't it? So yeah. when mangaves start to come onto the market, you'll, you can sell them here, yes, yeah, but yeah. then you'll be moving on to the next thing. So you're kind of like ahead of the game. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, that's part of plants, isn't it? It's part of loving plants. You just, mm. you're just constantly looking for new things. You know, I'm not particularly, you know, I'm not the sort of person who wants to just buy sort of Dutch trolleys of plants and get what's ever on the availability list you know it's not my it's not why I get I've got into plants you know mm -hmm. I've got into plants because I love plants and of course some of those plants on availability lists are nice plants but it's not you know I don't yes, just want to ship in 200 thing. of something you sure. know I want to find things that are one-offs so basically if you're listening at home and you would like to know what's going to be the next big thing contact Norfolk Ology <laughs> Company <laughs> speak to Paul yeah, and I've got it in my polytunnel <laughs> <laughs> he's already got it he's already on it <laughs> plant forecaster yeah yeah never mind plant right, hunter yeah. plant, plant forecaster. forecaster yeah we it's like interesting this you're talking about the tequiliana agave and its popularity uh, and how it it has been overgrown. The tequiliana isn't actually that tough and you no, don't right, no. find in the UK. No. Uh, and we were actually recently approached by a tequila company that was going on tour doing sort of mobile promotions in nightclubs or and they wanted a tequiliana and we said, you're not going to find a tequiliana. But then you do find so many of the um, specimens have similarities to yeah. other ones so we could find them. Right. Something yeah, so that was something very that was similar. similar. Sword-shaped leaves, sure. kind of upright kind of growth pattern. Um, 
but there's yeah. I mean, they, they they won't take hardly any frost at all to Keeleana, so it's a. We won't a, a be making our own Norfolk. You won't be I making Norfolk tequila. No, we won't. We did look <laughs> yeah, into it, but it's quite damn, <laughs> damn, and they take about eight years it's quite before a you. Process. It's I complicated. I was what on the film I was watching. I mean, they don't give too much away about their process, but I was watching them out in the fields harvesting. Wow, they yeah. are some tough plants. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Big, heavy, like proper chopping off yeah. the stems, you know. It's quite they incredible ton, to watch. They? They Absolutely. Really dense. Yeah. Sort of, you yeah. Know, the foliage is really dense and sinewy. It's really difficult stuff to cut. It was interesting just to listen to kind of the positives and negatives to that kind of farming because obviously it was it's causing problems with the soil. You know, it's monoculture at the end of the day and that's yeah. causing its own problems with biodiversity. But then also how do they continue to produce them um, when the demand for tequila is through the roof right now yeah, across yeah, yeah. the world. Yeah. Um, so uh, they have another product that's that's where it's where tequila came from. Now this is I can't remember the name of it, but it's a drink that they drink in South America that's made from other agave plants. It's subtle. Is it subtle? I that? can't remember the name. I'll have yeah. to check it out. Um, and they said that's actually the true drink. Yeah. Tequila is actually only made for the masses. But this true drink... Right. Oh, I can see Paul going... Yeah, no, no. Oh, about it's the true about. drink um, <laughs> that's made in South America and that can come from other agave. So they were, they were looking at doing that. I'll, I'll look up yeah, the name for you. Yeah. Um, but it was really interesting just to see all about it. Um, thank you so much. No, no, it's really well. interesting. I love sitting in here. <laughs> Can I, can I bring wine next time? Yes, yes you can. Do. We were, if <laughs> not, 10 o'clock in the morning. I think we might have I said had next time. Next not time. At time. <laughs> <laughs> a bottle of rum in here. But, um, not tequila. Though. Not tequila. Not tequila. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Where can everyone find you online? The Norfolk Olive Tree Company.co.uk. Uh, we're on all the social platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, you name it. But, yeah, all the W's, the Norfolk Olive Tree Company, .co .uk. And here in Norwich, we're just so lucky. We're bang in the centre of Norwich. We've got a beautiful view of the cathedral. Uh, so we're on Riverside Road overlooking the river and overlooking the cathedral. So we're very lucky in terms yeah. of... We've, five minutes from the railway station yeah so come and take a look i mean the courtyard is absolutely lovely and you will definitely have a very lovely welcome because there are blackbirds yes. <laughs> yes, it's very walt disney, <laughs> very walt, disney. walt disney world of olives and agaves <laughs> and mangaves too man thank you very much yeah. thank, thank you, you. Yeah. Well, I hope you enjoyed my chat with Antonia and Paul Smith from the Norfolk Olive Tree Company. It is always such a pleasure to go along and visit them because the Mediterranean courtyard is not only just so lovely, um, it's so atmospheric. You could, you genuinely feel like you are taken away somewhere overseas. And they're both so knowledgeable and such lovely people. So thoroughly enjoyed myself. I hope you enjoyed enjoyed it too and one day I will definitely have myself a great big old olive tree <laughs> I can't wait <laughs> so at the moment I'm recording this little piece over in Charlotte in North Carolina which is where I'm going to be on and off for the next couple of years but don't worry Michael and I will still be doing plenty of podcasting and so much more as usual and having our general plant shenanigans across the year I'll be back very soon, in fact, in just a few weeks. But the most exciting thing about being here in North Carolina is it's actually home to the native Venus flytrap. So sometime in the summer, I'm going to go on a little bit of an expedition. I'm going to have to probably drive about four or five hours over to the coast and I'm going to hunt down some Venus flytraps. And you never know, maybe Michael will even come over and join me. So that would be an awesome podcast, wouldn't it? And another thing about January, so there's no January, January blues going on here, or any more perhaps, because the month of January is no longer just that, is it? Of course, everybody knows it as Veganuary. So 
the movement has taken off incredibly well over the last couple of years and I thought it was appropriate just to chat about it briefly in this section because of course I'm vegan Uh, Michael isn't vegan but he's giving it a go this month so he's giving Veganuary a go Um, it's interesting to watch uh, to see what kind of food he's eating and how he's getting on but there was actually um, a couple of days ago a post on Veganuary's uh, Instagram account and they have 370,000 people signed up to do Veganuary this year that's incredible and their data shows that there's only three countries in the whole world where nobody has signed up so that's a lot of people across the world giving plant-based eating a go so for this podcast let's just focus on the plant side of being vegan and for me and I've said this before it's kind of like a lifestyle thing you know I grow so much fruit and vegetables and the flavor when you grow your own is just so amazing I mean you just you simply can't beat it and I know we always say it but if you don't grow your own try it because honestly you'll be amazed at the difference in flavor from things like sprouts that don't taste so great from the supermarket but when you grow them yourself they're amazing tomatoes cucumbers are always so much sweeter just everything really so I grow so much that I'd eat a lot of vegetables anyway and uh, fruit too, although I don't grow as much fruit as veg and salad. And um, I was vegetarian for years anyway. I decided to take the leap to veganism a while back now and I have never, I've never turned back for many reasons. My decision was for health, it was for the planet, it was for animals. It was because plants are just my life. I feel like I should be a living, breathing human plant. I just love them so much. But one thing I've learned through being vegan, and I think this is something perhaps I hadn't expected, is that my cooking has changed. My cooking is so much better. So when you work with plants and you grow your own plants and then you cook with them, but you're not adding meat or you're not adding dairy in any way, you have to look at other ways to make things tasty. So I've learned so much about herbs and spices and different flavorings and just different ingredients from all over the world to cook some really awesome dishes. So, you know, Looking at it from just simply the plant side, it's just absolutely brilliant. And I hope my husband agrees. I hope he's agreeing that I'm cooking much better than I did before. I'm sure I'm sure that he does. And now, of course, is a really great time to try it because there's so much available in the shops now. There's loads of plant-based food that you can pick up in almost all the supermarkets too. So um, at the beginning of the month, I put a post out just to say, if you're going to give Veganuary a go, keep me updated because if you start it on the 1st of January and you make it through the month and then you let me know how you got on, just giving it a month trial is amazing and brilliant. So well done to anyone giving it a go. Um, let me know because I'm going to send you a little gift. Yeah. So if you follow Plant Based Podcast on Instagram, Twitter or social media, you know, give us a shout. Tell us how you're getting on if you're trying Veganuary. How do you feel about it? How do you feel in yourself? Has it made you think of plants differently? Or has it made you think of the planet or animals or people differently as well? We would absolutely love to hear. Uh, One person who is updating us all the time, which is brilliant, is our friend over at the Essex Allotment. So give him a follow. And he has been showing kind of the food, his shopping and stuff. And it's been really, really interesting to see it from someone's point of view who's really really new to it like I'm so it's so involved in my everyday life I just don't think about it anymore um but yes it's really really good to see someone giving it a go right from the beginning so yeah there you go now another thing that I must mention before I finish chatting away is our plant-based podcast tv show so yes that's right we launched a little uh plant-based podcast tv as kind of special episodes for January and February. They're on our YouTube channel, so just look up the Plant-Based Podcast and you'll see not only the podcasts that we've recorded in the past, but some new, fun, interesting, 
sometimes silly, sometimes serious, hopefully educational and interesting to watch little films, which are all about, of course, the world of plants. So, so far, we've had a fun plant-based news. We've done a really fun to film and hope fun to watch uh, allotment games as well, where we went down to my allotment with Hench Herbivore. Uh, Hench, of course, is vegan, and he was also um, on the podcast in series one. So if you haven't listened to that, check it out. It's all about plant-based nutrition. So that was really interesting. And he put us through our paces on the allotment. We had to do courgette curls and watering can arm lifts and all kinds of things. It was really fun. But coming up, we've also got some uh, TV about plants that you can grow in a garden. So plants for shade, plants for sun. Um, We've got a load of houseplant talk. So we sat down, we looked at all of my houseplants. I can't remember how many there were, but there was well over 100, 150 houseplants. We focused on just a few, but we're going to chat through houseplants for sun and shade as well. So they'll be really interesting. I'm missing my houseplants. So while I'm out here in Charlotte, my houseplants have been divided by four people (laughs) and they're looking after them for me. Thank you guys if you're listening. So (laughs) we've got loads coming up on the Plant Based Podcast. We have some amazing, absolutely amazing new guests coming up for the Series 3, which will be released later on this year, not so long away. Um, So keep on listening and thank you as ever for supporting us. We love you plant lovers. And uh, next, the next Plant Based Podcast is down to Michael. So stay tuned. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Plant Based Podcast. Have a browse of the rest of the library or hop on over to the website, which is theplantbasedpodcast.net. You'll also find our social media links. Please connect with us and let us know about any plant based projects that you think we should be covering on the show. And make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you'll be the first to hear the next episode. We're releasing once a fortnight. So until next time, enjoy the world of plants.